The Hindenburg has often been compared to the Titanic. Both of them do share a lot of similarities. For one, both of them were some of the biggest in their field and were truly technological marvels for their times. Both of them absolutely dominated, and a seat on either of them was a privilege only given to the ultra-wealthy at the time. Though that is not where the similarities end. After all, both of them were considered to be seemingly undestroyable. But much like the sinking of the Titanic, the Hindenburg fell to pieces spectacularly. The Disaster The Hindenburg was a pretty big name among the Germans in the 1930s, especially when airships were considered to be the primary mode of aerial travel, unlike the airplanes of today. It was named after the late German president, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, and today, it might just be more popular than the person it was named after. It was truly a man-made marvel with all the luxury one could get in those times. It had a giant dining hall with a king-sized piano to enjoy, had the space to house more than 100 people on board, a lounge and a writing room, and even a special smoking room. But it wasn't perfect. After all, the creators had to scramble for an alternative fuel source during production. Even though all the details had been decided and finalized, the United States of America decided to block the export of helium. And considering that it was the biggest provider of helium at the time, and finding an alternative source of helium was out of the question, the makers of the airship had to abandon their dreams of using a non-flammable gas to power the ship. Instead, they decided to go with hydrogen, which was much more affordable, readily available, and much more effective as a fuel. The road to the disaster began on the evening of the 3rd of May, 1937 in Frankfurt, Germany, while it was on its way to Lakehurst, New Jersey, and then further to Newark for a trip. Three days later, on the evening of the 6th of May, the airship was on its way, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. It later took off carrying 36 passengers and 61 crew members. Its landing at Lakehurst was severely delayed due to some thunderstorms. The airship landed first at Boston, and then later took off for New York and then finally took off for Lakehurst, expecting a good climate at 6.22 p.m. But then, in an unthinkable move, the captain of the airship, Max Pruss, ordered to release some hydrogen gas for the ship to safely land at its destination. The crew noticed that the tail of the ship, from where the hydrogen was released, was lower than the rest of the ship. To make them equal, the crew released some hydrogen from the head, but it was to no avail as the tail kept dipping down. The crew then decided to release the water ballast weighing 1,100 kilograms from the tail to keep it in order, which further left the ship at a disadvantage. Not stopping at this, six crew members were sent at the head to balance the weight, and for a little while, it did seem to work. But that calm would not last for long. Adding to the troubles, the wind from the storm changed its direction from the east to the southwest, forcing the captain to make some risky turns for the crew and the passengers. It's widely believed that the risky turns led to a crack on the top of the ship's body, releasing an unstoppable wave of hydrogen. The crew later decided to release the landing ropes at a height of 180 feet. A few minutes later, according to what most experts believe, the ship caught fire due to an electric spark in the ship which lit the hydrogen. The fire spread towards the complete tail which later struck a blast and terrified the passengers. The fire kept spreading towards the outside and the inside, causing the 18 crew members at the head to lose their lives. Parts of the ship later went crashing down towards the people present at the ground, and later the whole ship. Surprisingly, the majority of the passengers had survived as they were lucky enough to jump out of the windows on time and land to the ground, albeit with some injuries. The search later found 13 passengers and 20 crew members to have died along with a member of the ground crew. After its crash, even though the hydrogen had burned enough and ran out, the diesel fuel of the airship kept burning for much later. As the people inside and outside were panicking, running around, suffering, terrified for their lives, and possibly already dead, there were four media teams with their cameras present at the ground recording the incident for the world to watch. Several days after the heart-wrenching event, a board of inquiry was set up at Lakehurst, tasked to run and find out the actual causes of the disaster. The investigation in America was headed by Colonel South Trimble Jr., while Hugo Eckener led the German commission. In a later research, Charles Rosendahl, the commander of the air station at Lakehurst, and the man in charge of the ground-based portion of the Hindenburg's landing maneuver, believed that the Hindenburg had been sabotaged. He laid out a general case for sabotage in his book, What About the Airship? The theory was later supported by the man who had been at the center of the incident, Max Pruss. In an interview in 1960 for Columbia University with Kenneth Leash, Pruss said, early dirigible travel was safe, and therefore he strongly believed that sabotage was to blame. To a much unexpected stance, standing against the captain was the crew of the Hindenburg, 
by which the claims of sabotage were rejected while they were hell-bent on the belief of a passenger being responsible for the disaster. The passenger in question was a certain Joseph Spa, a German acrobat and one of the survivors of this disaster. He had brought a pet dog with him and reportedly made several visits to his dog, who was being kept in a freight room near the stern. Those who suspected Spa based their suspicions primarily on those trips into the ship's interior to feed his dog. The claims were supported by the fact that Spa used to crack several anti-Nazi jokes during the trip and that he was agitated by the repeated delays in landing. Moreover, his acrobatic abilities meant that it would be easy enough for him to plant a bomb by climbing up into some specific part of the airship. Coming back to the investigations by both the involved nations, neither of the two nations supported the theory of the ship being sabotaged. The believers in disappointment made up reasons, some reliable and some unreliable as a counter to the statement of both the investigation teams, including that the real investigations by the German team were suppressed for political reasons. As a surprising statement, the newspapers and the media came up with their claims based on their reports while they watched the ship burn to ashes on the ground. The claims suggested that a Luger pistol was found among the remains and claimed that a passenger on the ship either committed suicide or shot a hole up in the airship. However, the theory was supported by zero evidence and later discarded by the officials. But later, Hugo Eckener stated the possibility of a shot being the cause of the disaster because of some threatening letters he had earlier received. In the aftermath of the Hindenburg disaster, the world witnessed the end of an era. The majestic airships, once seen as the future of luxury air travel, were now marred by a catastrophic failure. The Hindenburg, a symbol of German pride and technological achievement, lay in ruins, its destruction as rapid as it was devastating. The theories of sabotage, mechanical failure, and human error circulated, each with its proponents and detractors. Despite investigations and testimonies, the true cause of the disaster remained shrouded in mystery, a puzzle lost to the flames of history. What remained undeniable, however, was the impact of the Hindenburg disaster on public perception and air travel. The vivid images of the burning airship, broadcasted and printed across the globe, marked a turning point. The confidence in airships dwindled, giving way to the rise of aeroplanes as the preferred mode of air travel. This shift was not just technological but also symbolic, representing a change in the dreams and aspirations of a generation. The Hindenburg disaster, much like the Titanic, became a cautionary tale about the hubris of mankind in the face of nature's unpredictability and the limitations of technology. It served as a stark reminder of the fragility of human endeavors, no matter how grand or seemingly invincible. The story of the Hindenburg, enveloped in flames and mystery, continues to echo through time, a poignant testament to both human achievement and tragedy.